whatever you did, if it wasn't good enough, you needed to try and do better and keep at it. Actually, village life produces the philosophical ideas that are germane to democratic thought and practice. I mean, just losing four of your bandmates, soulmates is bad enough. But the worst thing is out of those four families, two of the families blamed me. But the progress from 1991 to 2017, I think only took India to a better place. It was really through the, uh, th through the transition into politics that I, uh, that I had the good luck of becoming a writer. Catherine the Great and Potemkin Stalin, the court of the Red Tsar, and young Stalin have captured its epic proportions, the rise and revolutionary fall of the Romanovs, the intimate lives of the Tsars and Tsarinas, their ideas of empire and changing political figures and systems of government. Simon has argued that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a gamble motivated by a desire to restore Russian glory, a vision embedded in its sweeping past. In conversation with author and academic Tripudaman Singh, Simon examines Russia's present ambitions through the lens of a layered history. This conversation will be followed by a Q&A, and uh, the speaker's books will be on sale. They are on sale at the bookshop, so we encourage all of you to go out and buy a copy. May I please invite on stage Simon Sebag Montfio in conversation with Tripudaman Singh. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here, and especially for me to be able to talk to you, uh, someone who brings um, historical research and, I guess, narrative wizardry together in a combination that's, uh, that's very rarely seen. And uh, so I'm going to start off with, uh, uh, you know, with a question that actually goes back to a piece you wrote for the New Statesman back in 2014, uh, following the, uh, you know, the, the, the protests at Euromedan and the ouster of Viktor Yankovic, uh, where you said that the global significance of, uh, of what has just happened lies in, the tangle, in its tangled relationship with Moscow. Ukraine has an essential role in Russia's vision of itself, just as Russia is omnipresent in Ukraine's own traumatized consciousness. Uh, and then you end by saying that the powder keg that is Kiev has the potential to unleash civil war or worse, intervention by Putin. Uh, looking back, uh, now that seems really, really prof prophetic. And uh, so what, uh, what really kind of drove this argument? Uh, what is this vision really uh, of Russia that, you know, that Russia has of itself uh, and that gives Ukraine such a sort of central role in the Russian imagination? Um, yeah, nice question. Um, thank you. And by the way, great to be doing this with you. I'm very honored to be, um, to be up here with you. It's very, very nice. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think, God, I'd forgotten that I'd written that. I was kind of slightly dreading what the hell I might have said. Um, uh, all those eight years ago. But anyway, that doesn't sound too, too bad. Um, but um, I, I think, you know, I mean, if you look at Russian history since the sort of 17th century, um, 
you know, Ukraine, you know, they, they called Ukraine Little Russia. Mm -hmm. um, Ukraine was, and New Russia. So those very names give you an idea of how they saw Russia, how they saw Ukraine, which was as a sort of essential province of the Russian Empire. Um, one of the interesting things about it, though, is that, you know, it, um, of course, the northern part with Kiev was was gained in in the in the 1650s, but the but the but the southern part where the fighting where you know the the the, the, the littoral of the um, Black Sea was only gained in the late 18th century. You know these cities that um, they're fighting over now. You know um, uh, Kherson or Sebastopol or um, Mariupol were all founded by Prince Potemkin yeah. in the 18th, in the in Catherine the Great in the late 18th century. So they're exactly the same age as Washington D.C., for example, mm -hmm. um, and they were fashioned as as sort of cosmopolitan cities by cosmopolitan, often French. Um, aristocrats, and so they were never envisaged as sort of purely Slavic Russian cities in the first place. So they really belong in the slightly more cosmopolitan uh, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, the tangled history is such that the Russians regard um, regard Ukraine a bit like the British, the English might regard Wales, or right. Ireland, or Scotland, mm -hmm. and um, they simply can't sort of they they simply can't envisage. Um, an independent Ukraine with its own culture. And that has been a struggle. And that, that's been going on for a hundred years, that sort of tangled, that tangled relationship. So that is, of course, as you mentioned, Eastern Ukraine. But the Western part, for example, was only gained uh, even later than that, which is uh, just uh, with the uh, Hitler, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And uh, uh, does that sort of affect how, how Ukraine is viewed in, 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 in Russia? Is there a divide between how they think of Ukraine you know, of the eastern part and Ukraine? Yeah, uh, so there are three parts. Ukraine? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Trevor Demon. There are three parts of, of Ukraine. That, there are actually four parts of Ukraine um, which were put together by Star Lenin and Stalin. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, uh, and, and the sort of the northern part, Kiev, was gained by the, by the, by the Romanov Tsars, which we, we, you know, who are the subject of this, this conversation. And the southern part was, was conquered from the Ottoman Empire yeah. and from the Tatar Khanate of Crimea. And these are kind of vanished, vanished states now. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they weren't either Russian or Ukrainian. Yeah. They weren't Slavic at all. And then they were colonized. Um, and then, then, the, then, the, then the Western part was actually ruled by the Habsburgs. It was ruled mm -hmm. from Vienna, no. which is an amazing Think, thought. Just, yeah. um, it was ruled from Vienna, Lvov, um, Lemberg, as the Austrians mm -hmm. called it, um, was, ruled, was, was, you know, was ruled by, Ger by Germans, Austrians. So and that was only gained, you're absolutely right, very late in the story. So, and then of course the extreme East was, was added on to Ukraine by Stalin um, when, when they constructed the, the, the Republic of Ukraine. Ukraine. So what you have here is a sort of, is a, is a fascinating um, phenomenon where how are nations built? You know, nations are built by stories, by shared experiences, um, by shared struggles, by agony, by pain, by suffering, by heroism. So, you know, the creation, Ukraine has kind of, um, was, it was quite a weak state when it was formed in 1991. And the, you know, Putin's own actions have actually hugely fortified and consolidated and, and helped create a really strong Ukrainian consciousness. Um, and I think that you know, the state will be, the state that emerges will be very, will be strong, formed, forged in war. So talking about Putin, I mean, so very uh, famously or infamously the other day, uh, uh, Putin compared himself uh, to Peter the Great um, and almost, I guess, every yeah. uh, Russian politician uh, aspires to, to sort of that, that, that level, uh, which is, again, something that you, that you mentioned. But the Romanovs uh, were, you know, probably the greatest empire builders on Earth. I mean, the empire expanded at, at a mind-boggling rate of something like 20,000 square miles a year. Um, uh, you know, averaged out to. And so its imperial past, of course, uh, animates uh, much, uh, much of its present ambitions. But uh, what is it 
about Peter the Great that you know makes makes this sort of invocation so alluring? Uh, That's for, a good for question. Russian politicians, because you know, as and again, I'm I'm, I'm quoting you because you say, well, Peter the Great was a was a born autocrat, as visionary as he was meticulous, but he was also, you know, if I if I might call him that, a Europhile, uh, and um, you know, he, he he got his children to marry into European royalty, uh, and he built Saint Petersburg as a window into Europe. Uh, so, what kind of makes makes this uh, invocation so alluring for for Russian leaders? Well, that's a great question. Peter the Great is the sort of dominating figure of my book, the, the, the Romanovs, which, um, uh, which, which really tells the story of this dynasty, this extraordinary family. And you're right. I mean, you know, we tend to think of the Romanovs because of the, because of the tragic end as a sort of failing, exhausted, incompetent um, ruling dynasty. In fact, you know, they were the most successful. I mean, after the Genghis Khan family, they were really the most successful empire builders in world history. <laughs> And you know the empire that they built still exists, essentially, mm -hmm. is the Russian Federation. So it's not a sort of, I mean, we, we, everyone this week regarded Put Vladimir Putin as slightly mad for talking about Peter the Great. But every Russian leader after Peter the Great, every Romanov Tsar, um, every, every general secretary, every president compares himself to Peter the Great. Because Peter the Great had it all. Um, he had. The amazing thing was he had everything that a politician wants. He had the vision. He knew what he wanted to do with Muscovy, the, 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 the kingdom that he inherited. He had the vision that he, he knew that he wanted to modernize it. He knew he wanted to bring in European technology to make it a great power. Um, he had the resources to do it. And lastly, he had the acumen, the ability to actually make these things happen which is very unusual, you'll admit, is, you know, to have those three things together. He was literally the most extraordinary character. He was six foot six, six foot seven. He had a twitching face. Um, he was extremely violent. He had a constant, he had a short temper. He regularly beat up his courtiers, beat them with a stick, punched them in the face. Um, he had an iron constitution. He could party like Led Zeppelin on tour. Um, he, his parties were terrifying. Um, everything about him was fearsome. Um, at his parties, um, naked girls jumped out of cakes. Um, there were dwarf fights. Um, he would, people would have, get so drunk. People actually often died at his parties. People died of al alcohol poisoning. And there were regularly fights between his top ministers. Um, one actually stabbed another with a fork. Um, another time, um, Peter fought his best friend and top um, henchman, and they both then just passed out under a table and lay there for, for 12 hours afterwards. Um, and yet this man was also, as you said, you know, meticulous in his planning, absolutely driven um, in, what he want, in his vision of Russia. Um, but he did it with, with absolutely brute force and technology. So... You know, he traveled in the West to learn about how to build ships, how to build guns. It was Peter that created the artillery, the, 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 the way that the Russian army today is totally an artillery-based force comes from Peter the Great, who was obsessed with gunnery and loved dismantling and putting together um, cannon and ships. Um, it was Peter that achieved all these things. I just want to tell a couple of stories about sure, Peter, sure. Because, if I may, because he's such a fascinating character. Um, Peter, it was Peter who was, he was very obsessed, as I, as I said, with dismantling things, and he was obsessed with the human body. So he, he, he liked dismantling ships, he liked dismantling guns, and he also dis liked dismantling people. And when he was in Holland, he regularly attended um, uh, cases where the doctors would um, dissect human bodies, and he was fascinated by that. And him and his, he, he, he afterwards he went up to the the surgeon and said, I, I, "I'm fascinated by dead bodies. Can I bite the body?" And he then made all his top henchmen in his entourage bite the body. But the point was that he won the battle of Poltava, and that was the decisive battle in the creation of modern Russia. And um, he defeated the, the Swedish Empire, and he took the Baltic. Mm -hmm. He made Poland into a, 
client state. He even got Russian troops into Germany, um, which was then the Holy Roman Empire. Um, he was less successful against the Ottomans and the Persians, but really he created a new country, Russia, and he was the first emperor of Russia. He's the gold standard that every Russian leader wants to emulate because he commanded in battle himself, and every Russian Tsar wants to be a commander in chief. So, yeah, he's the most extraordinary character um, in Russian history, and so it's no coincidence that Putin dreams of being Peter the Great. The question, though, then is, uh, given the commanding presence, uh, the looming sort of presence of Peter the Great over every succeeding Russian Tsar or Emperor or uh, President, um, what about Peter's Europhilia? So why does that, uh, uh, because there's quite a lot of ambivalence about the yeah. West, and sometimes I, uh, the figure that I found uh, most interesting and I think perhaps even fruitful as a sort of a comparison uh, was Nicholas I, yeah. uh, someone who dreamed uh, of a Russian Constantinople, uh, began a rather sort of disastrous war in the Crimea. Uh, someone who was a Slavophile who, you know, idolized the Russian world of uh, peasantry, villages, um, and orthodoxy, uh, and who also disdained the, the kind of flaccid decadence uh, of, of the West. And uh, even during his reign, there was the governing ideology, which kind of came to be, uh, as you mentioned, orth orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality, which right. was devised during uh, his reign. So do you see this as a fruitful comparison? And why then was sort of Peter's Europhilia not, uh, not also something that, uh, you know, that present Russian leaders kind of really, uh, really look back on? Well, I think we always misunderstand, and um, this is interesting with Peter and with Nicholas, um, we always must understand Russian rule, rulers who are reformers. Mm -hmm. And so Peter the Great is, in, in, sort of, in British textbooks, he's always regarded as a sort of sympathetic character because, and a pro-Western character because he, because he reformed Russia and made it more Western. But really he was interested in Western technology to make Russia strong, to make Russia a great power. And that could only happen at the cost of Western powers, Sweden, and, and Austria and other, and other Western powers. So I think that one misunderstand, we, you know, we misunderstand his Europhilia. What he really wanted was weapons. He right. wanted the weapons, and those were made in the West. Um, he wanted um, Western know-how, and he, he hired many Germans to come and or Swiss to come and work for him. So um, that, was his, that was his concept of Europhilia. And, um, but of course, you're absolutely right. You know, he made everyone wear sort of German clothes. He made them get rid of their beards. He made them get rid of their so beards and, so and their kaftans. And, and that's why Nicholas II, the last Tsar, hated Peter the Great, because he said Peter the Great had Europeanized, um, had Europeanized um, Russia. Um, and yet he too aspired to be a Peter the Great, to command in battle. And we all know that that didn't end well. Um, but Nicholas I is a very interesting case. You ask him. Nicholas I was an incredibly successful ruler. Mm -hmm. And the most interesting thing um, about the 19th century Romanov Tsars is that they were so successful. I mean, you had, from, you had four in a row who were incredibly impressive rulers. And, you know, the chances of that in a, in a, in a dynasty is quite small. Mm -hmm. You know, you had Alexander I, you know, who fought all the way to Paris. Then you had Nicholas I, who almost took, you know, Constantinople. No then you had Alexander II, who almost took Ale Constantinople no again. And then you had Alexander III. So it was only the last Tsar that they really, the standard of these, um, these rulers really fell. But Nicholas I is the one who is most similar to Putin, for the mm -hmm. reasons yeah. that you state quite correctly. And also the fact that the Western democracies, they weren't fully democracies by then, but yeah. Britain and France was slow to react to him, and he constantly outmaneuvered them. Um, and it was only in the late 1850s that they, um, they managed to sort of, you know, they managed to fight the C Crimean War yeah. to stop him. And then they broke Russia for about 30 years. But Nicholas, Nicholas I is a very, very formidable figure. Um, deeply unpleasant person, mm -hmm. by the way, and a very anti-Semitic, hated democracy, hated England, um, and was really very like, very like Putin, believed that you know, the Western democracies were really kind of um, hypocritical, 
hypocritical um, uh, enterprises, and so he despised them. But um, yeah, I mean, I think he's the, he, he is, his policies are very, very similar to, to yeah. Putin. No, and what I personally found very interesting was, of course, both this, uh, this sort of governing ideology that they came out, which is orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality, uh, but also that Nicholas, uh, Nicholas I saw, often saw himself as a sort of guardian against revolution uh, in Europe, or you know, representing the forces of conservatism yeah. against, uh, against the revolutions that kind of swept Europe uh, during his reign, uh, especially 1848, 1849. Uh, and you know, he... Uh, he thought he was a bulwark, really, against liberalism. He, he helped the Habsburgs suppress an uprising, uh, and you know, you can. There is, uh, there's definitely a similar strand of thinking that you see uh, in Russia today, uh, of the idea that, in a way, you know, the idea that Russia is the anti-West or the opposite uh, of the West. Would you, would yeah. you trace such a trajectory? Do you think? Do you think? I think that's that, right. I think that's a good there? point. I mean, there are great similarity. You know, Putin. Who, is to, who hates these, uh, these overthrow, the overthrow, for example, of Gaddafi, yes, who exactly, stopped the exactly. overthrow of Assad, who, in, um, who you know, loathes the color revolutions in, in Tbilisi and Ukraine. Um, you know, there's a real similarity there between you. are absolutely right. That's another big similarity. And, um, but I think, you know, I think what you see in all these cases is the pathological Russian tendency to autocracy. <clears throat> to one-man rule, and we see today, you know, there are huge advantages in dictatorship. You know, you can make very quick decisions uh, on your own. You can act with great stealth and secrecy. Um, you know, you don't have to consult the, the you don't have to consult the press or a parliament or or a, or a party. But there's also a great fault when it goes wrong. Everything, you know, people and places get broken. And, you know, deter and, and it's very hard to reverse um, the trajectory you're on. <clears throat> and you saw that with Nicholas I. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, he, he he'd had 30 years of success. He'd been spoiled by success. And when um, Palmerston and, the, and, the, and the, you know, Britain and France started to resist, um, he, couldn't change, he couldn't change course fast enough. And he didn't believe they'd do anything. And they did, and they fought him directly. Now we can't do that because you know he's a nuclear power. If the you know um, if if Nicholas I had been a nuclear power, there wouldn't have been a Crimean War. True. Um, but one of the pro another problem with these one man you know these one man states is, uh, as you see with Putin, is succession, mm -hmm. and that is a real problem. Now I mean I Peter the Great, whose flavor of the month this this week. Um, you know, beat his own son to death, tortured his own yep. son to death and killed him. And of course, the problem with that is when you kill your own son, you don't have a successor anymore. And so the rest of the 18th century is a very, very interesting time in Russian and European history um, because the Romanov dynasty was almost entirely women. Women ruled Russia for 100 years, um, culminating in Catherine the Great, the great, the great Catherine. And this was, the, this was a result of having no male heirs because they'd been killed by Peter. True, true. But uh, th the point that I kind of want to latch on to is, uh, is this idea that there is something almost uh, preordained about autocracy uh, in, in Russia. And I, I think you argue that Russia has always been dedicated to autocracy in a way. Um, and periods without uh, autocratic rule have really tended to be, uh, to be chaotic, I guess, to say the least. Uh, times of troubles, well, the original one before the establishment uh, of the Romanov uh, dynasty, and then, uh, of course, the second, you know, times of troubles during and just after the revolution. And, uh, uh, you know, you have, uh, I think it was in one of your pieces in the New Statesman previously also characterized in a sense, the, uh, the, more, the, uh, the kind of chaotic Yeltsin years as, as a, really a, a, a time of troubles. And so do you think that uh, this, uh, the experience of Russia when it is not an autocracy, and uh, 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 you know, each, each time of troubles ends with the reestablishment of an autocratic order. And so, uh, so you could, you know, you could trace this through the Russian secret police. You know, the Tsar's secret police, the Okhrana, the 
the um, the Cheka, the NKVD, and so on. Uh, why do you think this is? Why do uh, do these times of troubles not oftentimes lead to dispersal of power, to establishment of more uh, more, think, more liberal I think sort of it's regimes? Very, I think it's, it's a very good question. It's the big, this is the million dollar question about yeah. Russian history, isn't it? I mean, why has Russia always had autocracies? I mean, I mean, I, I answer that because I, I just look at, you just start with the geography of Russia, the mm -hmm. fact that it has no natural borders, it's the Eurasian steppe. Um, that needs to defend it from, from the east, um, you know, came the Mongols, you know, from the west came the Swedes and, and, and obviously many other invaders, the French, the Germans. Um, and so, you know, the, the Russian state has always been on a military standing, the, 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 the czars, the presidents have always been military commanders. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's why um, times of troubles, whenever the, the, the autocracy has been relaxed, instead of seeing the growth of a civic society, um, before that can even take place, um, there's just been chaos. And a chaos because Russia is really is, is an empire. But also, the chaos itself is quite interesting because a lot of the times it's believed that the chaos is kicked off by attempts to reform. And so you see this, uh, yeah. you know, with the assassination of, I think, Alexander II, Second, yeah. uh, who, uh, you know, emancipated serfs and uh, initiated a lot of reform and then ended up being assassinated. Uh, and then, of course, um, uh, you see this again with uh, Perestroika and uh, Gorbachev, is that periods of reform generally tend to uh, lead to more chaos rather than a sort of gradual... Uh, 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 any sort of gradual movement towards liberalism, and why? So, what 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 makes it so? I mean, I, I find it quite interesting to think about why a reform is so susceptible to creating, uh, to leading to these sorts of times of of, of troubles. Well, well, I, 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 to Tocqueville, as you know, as you know, yeah. the Tocqueville said, you know, a country is always at its, it's a, an autocracy is always at its most dangerous point when it when it's about to reform itself. Mm -hmm. And it's because, you know, that the medicine often kills the patient. And, you know, when we're talking about Nicholas II, for example, you know, everyone says, if only he'd reformed, if only he'd started reform earlier. Well, one of the reasons why he didn't is because as a little boy, he'd been, he'd been, he'd been skating on the Neva when he was called urgently to find his grandfather with his legs blown off, dying, Alexander II dying. And the little boy, um, Nicholas, then I think about seven years old, saw, saw his grandfather there. And that's, that's what happened to reformers. So, so I think he was, I think that the sort of the sheer danger of, 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 unle you know, of, rela of a relaxation um, can, lead to, can, lead to kind of, can lead to complete chaos. And that's always the great fear of the, of the rulers and of the Russian people who have to live in this situation. So, so it's a very kind of, it's a very delicate balance. balance. Let's say no one's got it right in Russia so far because Gorbachev did exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about Gorbachev is that watching Gorbachev reform was Deng Xiaoping from China. Mm -hmm. And he watched it and he said, Gorbachev is an idiot. He actually said that because, because Gorbachev tried to do everything at the same time. He tried to reform the economy, um, the state power, and the nature of the empire, right. the multinational, multi-ethnic empire, all at the same time, which actually was an act of complete insanity. So is it, like Alexander II, something that breaks a kind of unofficial compact that seems to exist between the Russian nobility and the autocrat? Uh, because that's what is often argued, is that the emancipation of serfs really uh, a kind of broke the unofficial compact that existed. Uh, between. So is, is that something that yes, I think that's tends right. to repeat itself uh, in Russia over and over again? Yeah, I mean, once you start to reform, you lose the, no, you, you lose the loyalty of the nobility. And that's what happened. Um, the nobility were impoverished, and their states were no longer worth anything. I mean, Alexander II is by far the most attractive character mm -hmm. um, in, of the Romanov family. A deeply unpleasant family, I believe. But then power is very coarsening and corrupting. Um, it's hard to be very powerful for a very long time, um, you know, and keep your decent, um, the milk of human kindness. Mm -hmm. um, Alexander II was very unusual for this. I mean, he was physically attractive, good-looking, 
um, uh, a bon vivant. He regarded himself as a European gentleman. He loved women. His, his love affair with his, his mistress, Katya Dolgorukai, was is, one, is an amazing love story. Um, and their correspondence, by the way, is one of the most erotic ever written by, you know, ever written by a statesman ever in history, including in the in 20th century. It's fairly, when I was reading it in the archives in uh, Moscow, I was, li my, I was literally astonished by the stuff they wrote down um, in, these, in these letters. And you must, it's in the book, but you must have a look. I, I don't know you well enough to tell you all the stuff that's in these letters. Um, but su put it, suffice it to say, it has some sexual acts that I didn't think had been invented till the 1960s. But they, they're, there they are in there in the 1860s. So he's a remarkable character. And of course, he understood that you had to reform Russia. Um, he freed the serfs. Um, and like Lincoln, serfdom was very like slavery in some ways. And like Lincoln, he was assassinated for it. Um, but equally, he was every inch a Romanov in the sense that, you know, he really wanted to, to expand Russia. Um, that was what being a Romanov meant, and he wanted to take it, um, Istanbul. Yes. Zar, they called it, Zar, they called Constantinople Zagrad, city of emperors. And um, he very, very nearly took, um, took um, the Ottoman Empire in 1877, mm. 1878, and he was only stopped by Disraeli and the British. To bring me, the question of Constantinople, and uh, so Constantinople was widely seen as the second Rome. And this is another sort of recurrent, uh, you know, idea that, uh, that Moscow really is, uh, is the third Rome. And after the great uh, schism of uh, 1054, the Russian emperor is really the protector of the, uh, of the Orthodox faithful, uh, not just in Russia, but also uh, further afield in the Balkans and uh, in, in, in Eastern Europe. Is this, uh, where, was this an idea that had a, a kind of long, uh, long durée history in, uh, within, within the Russian court? Yeah, I mean, this is so important. This is such a good question. Yeah. Thank you, because, I mean, what we're really seeing here, very much what we're seeing with Putin here, is not just a sort of hero-worshipping the, um, the great conquerors of the, Roman, of the Romanov period, you know, namely, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, Prince Potemkin, yeah, yeah. Um, Nicholas the First. But also, what we're seeing here is the channeling of the very, very um, rare, uh, uh, rare, rare and strong Russian sense of an international mission, mission. Exactly. A, a religious mission, um, orthodoxy. But not just pure orthodoxy, but a mission to, to a mission of the Russian world. They, Putin and his philosophers call it the Russian world. But this idea has come, really goes back to the conversion of St. Vladimir, right back, you know, right back in the ninth century. It really comes um, very strong with the fall of well, Constantinople, Constantinople in, in, in uh, 1453. And then, then the Russian Tsars start to uh, promote themselves as the heirs to the emperors. And so, it really comes from before, before the Romanovs. It comes from the Rurikid dynasty. Um, and they, they, they start, they called themselves Caesars, Tsars, and what the hell's going on back there? Um, so nothing, nothing to worry about. Um, so, so, you know, that, it really comes from that. And of course the Romanov, I mean, Ivan the Terrible really believed that. Ivan the Terrible, you know, um, launched a crusade to take the southern carnates. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's very interesting looking at Russian history. What we forget today is that, you know, Russia was originally Muscovy, and Muscovy, the Grand Principality of Muscovy, emerged out of a series of carnates. If you look at the court of Ivan the Terrible, half the, half the no nobility were actually born Muslim, Turki Turkic, or Mongol um, nobility. And they were Khans, and they converted. They converted to. They converted to Orthodoxy, you know. So, though it's though it's often repeated that you know that Russia really is the way it is because of the Byzantines, mm -hmm. the, the Mongol the Mongol influence is much stronger, sure. and the Mongols too had a tradition of world power. You know, Genghis Khan and the and the, and his family believed that they were 
um, destined by God, by Tengri, the blue sky god of the steppes, to, to conquer, to, to world dom dominion. So, you know, the Mongol, I think the Mongol side of, of, the, Russian, of the Russian state and the Russian leadership is, is often understated. Very interesting, because of course the war in uh, the Crimea, uh, one of the reasons that it started um, was uh, the original war in the Crimea, was of course the Russian claim to be, uh, to be a protector of the Orthodox faithful beyond the boundaries of the Russian Empire. Sure. And uh, so is, is, this, uh, is, this, um, is this sort of mission uh, uh, still a force in Russian politics? Um, or, and do you still see it, it really, as something it really that is you know, a really drives, I mean, yes. uh, drives Russian ambitions? Yes. I mean, you, know, you only have to read all the essays of um, Putin recently to see that you know, he believes this stuff. Now, a lot of people say, it's so extraordinary. How can this guy who you know, grew up in the, the communist Soviet Communion. Union um, you know, came that's, of age? That's, that's one of the points. Because yeah. in the communist period, there was, of course, an emphasis on Eurasianism. Uh, rather than this kind of w looking westward at, at the orthodox faithful. So yeah. uh, it's interesting that this strand, you know, come comes, comes through almost uh, without damage uh, through, through that period. I think, the thi I think Putin, I mean, I think Putin wants to just channel, um, borrow and commandeer all the ideas and um, s successes um, of, of the, three the three great regimes before him, you know, namely the, the Bolsheviks, the Romanovs, and the Rurik princ the princes. And essentially, he wants to borrow all of them, um, promiscuously, incontinently, without any limits, just to take what was successful. And he himself has talked about this a lot in, his, you know, in, in conversations, that um, he wants to borrow all these things and, and to promote them now. And he believes there's a historic opportunity. He believed there was a historic opportunity, mm -hmm. thanks to the feckless presidency of, of, of Biden, um, the, the division of America, the division of the EU with Brexit, the buffoonery of many of the of much of the leadership in the West. He saw an opportunity, and I think he believed it was a unique opportunity in Russian history. And I think the longer you're on the Russian throne. Um, the more you believe this stuff. I mean, Stalin, used to, when he used to walk around the Kremlin, he used, to, he used to walk on the cobbles of the Kremlin, and he used to say, Ivan the Terrible walked on these cobbles. He, he, he repeatedly said that to people. You've got to remember that all these rulers are growing up in the same buildings, in the same place as these previous rulers. And the longer you spend in these, in these amazing buildings, um, in the Kremlin, but also in St. Petersburg, of course, because that's where, for some of the, some of the time, um, the, you know, the Romanovs ruled from. Um, but the longer you spend in these things, you're, you're affected by the same spirit. But more than that, they're ruling the same space. They have the same issues. They're facing the same geopolitical questions. And so, so you know, they are bound to call, it, it, it's, it sounds absurd when someone like Putin is talking about Peter the Great. But in his mind, he's facing the, the same issues, the same questions, the same political um, challenges. And he saw a unique opportunity. And of course, he looks at the Romanov dynasty, and you look, he looks at the most successful members of that dynasty. And those are, of course, you know, we start from, he starts from Peter the Great, um, who really was, you know, who, who, who casts a long shadow, as you said. When I, when I started to write my, um, book on Catherine the Great and Potemkin. I was working in the archives. You know, it was interesting because no one had really worked in these archives um, during the Soviet period. Because Peter the Great and Ivan the Terrible were accepted as Soviet heroes and there was a cult of personality about them because they were parallel, regarded as parallel to Stalin. And Stalin was fascinated by those two people. But because, because Catherine the Great was a woman, and, um, and, and was German, mm -hmm. um, there was a question mark about whether they would, they would make a cult about Catherine the Great. And the alternative was to make a cult about Prince Potemkin. And Stalin himself, when he, stud he studied P Potemkin a lot, and he said, you know, Potemkin was a genius. He said Potemkin was a genius. But Potemkin and Catherine were a very, very decadent um, pair, astonishingly talented. Yeah. 
I think Potemkin was the greatest minister of the entire Romanov um, dynasty. And he was virtually, he ruled with Catherine the Great virtually like a czar. Their love affair, their partnership, I think is the most remarkable public um, partnership between a man and a woman in world history. Um, it, started, it started with politics, it started with power and sex. Um, they were both brilliant potentates, incredibly talented, but also they were very attracted to each other. Their letters are, again, the most astonishing correspondence. And while the, the correspondence I mentioned earlier between Alex, Alexander II and his mistress was basically private, Catherine and Potemkin's is literally, it's about everything. It's about the entire Russian state. They talk about their sex lives, they talk about their lovers and mistresses, but they also talk about whether to make war, which, which cities to, to, to besiege. And um, the letters are very inspiring, very fascinating. And some of them are 20 pages long. Some of them are just, some of them are just love letters that just say, one of Catherine the Greats just says, me love the general, general loves me, for example. <laughs> And a lot of them are very, very touching. And they were both such unusual characters. You know, she was brought, brought, she was a German princess from a very, very poor family, brought to Russia to marry the heir to the Russian throne at the age of 14. She spoke no Russian, and she was just dumped there um, in the Russian court. It was the most terrifying court, ruled by um, Empress Elizaveta, who was the daughter of Peter the Great. So you can imagine what she was like. Um, and Catherine the Great cultivated, learnt perfect Russian, um, but she hated her husband. Her husband, Peter the, Peter the Third, was a um, rather vicious German popinjay um, who she was very unhappy with. And so she had to make her own way. And she took lovers and she became the Russian candidate, the, the Russian candidate, even though she was born a German. And ultimately, you know, she seized the power from her husband. When you seized power from a, from a czar, in, in an absolute system, you have to kill them. So mm -hmm. she was pretty partly responsible for killing her own husband. Um, but she proved one of the most dynamic um, one of the most dynamic czars, and the, you know, probably the greatest of the Romanovs with Peter. But her partner Potemkin was part of that success. Which brings us to Ukraine and the Crimea, which you brought up. I mean, it was Potemkin that went and, first of all, annexed the Zaporozhian Cossacks. Mm -hmm. in, in today's, um, you've, heard the word, you've heard the name Zaporozhia in, in southern Ukraine being fought over. Um, he, then, he then annexed Crimea. And then he annexed all the southern, um, the southern coast and the Crimea and built Sebastopol and founded the Russian fleet. So when I, when I wrote the Catherine and Potemkin book, um, I, was, I was told that Putin had read the book, and, which is kind of interesting. Because unlike Stalin, Putin was not an intellectual. He's not an inter intellectual. Mm -hmm. Stalin spent his whole time reading. And Putin wasn't very interested in, is not, very, is not particularly interested in reading. Um, but he liked the book. And so, ironically, um, thanks to, it was thanks to him that I got access to Stalin's papers. All right, what, a, what an interesting story. We, we, uh, so but just before we go to the audience for questions, there's one question that I've wanted to ask, which yeah. is uh, uh, about Queen Victoria's, uh, a young Queen Victoria's sort of flirtatious relationship with, uh, uh, with I think it was Zarevich uh, Alexander II. And uh, so what, what happened and was there, was there any prospects for that sort of going, going, going somewhere? That's and what might have happened if it had? Oh, that's a great question. Well, yeah, it's one of those great what ifs of world history, yeah. um, which is a great one to ask. Um, Ale I, I, the person I was describing earlier is Alexander II, one of the most, probably the most attractive of the dynasty. Um, he, he went, to, he visited London um, in, the, in the 1830s when Queen Victoria had just become queen. And when they met, they were very attracted to each other. I mean, Queen Victoria, you, you have to imagine what these two were like. He was, he was dazzlingly good looking, blonde, blue eyed, six foot three. And she was tiny um, with porcelain skin, 
blonde, but also blue-eyed, very Germanic. Queen Victoria was basically German. And, um, and, so, and, and, and she was the most eligible woman in the world. And he was very attracted to, each, to, to her. And when they, they danced together for a whole night, and of course, everyone watching wondered if they would marry. Um, but there were big problems, because she was the queen of England, a, pro a Protestant kingdom, obviously. And he was um, the heir to the great Orthodox empire of Russia. So there was no way either of them could convert um, religion and keep their throne. That was the first problem. But the second problem is that the relationship between Britain and Russia was very fraught at the time. Um, nowadays, we, have, we, we kind of remember the Second World War and the First World War, and we think that Britain and Russia have always been friends. But in the 19th century, Britain and Russia were absolutely die-hard enemies. After, once, once, we'd fought, once they'd defeated Napoleon, um, by the 1820s, relations were, were, were darkening. And they were rivals in all sorts of, of all parts of the world, but particularly Central Asia and India. Yeah. Um, by the way, one of the things I was fascinated to find, um, because it, this is a, this is a, forgive me a slight detour. Yeah, we have about two minutes. So. Give me a slight detour. But you know, one of the things I found in the in in the, in the letters of Alexander II was him writing to his commanders saying, "Please, please let please send me a plan for the invading of British India." <laughs> so anyway, the, the marriage never happened for that reason. But it's one of the great what ifs. It is. Um, it is indeed. Uh, so I think it's now time to open the floor up to questions from the audience. Uh, and if anybody would like a question, the, um, there's a mic next to you. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. I, I, I wonder whether you might be able to tell us why Russia never had any grander imperial ambitions beyond kind of proximate states. You know, you have Britain wanting to conquer various parts of the world, and many other European empires doing the same. But Russia always seems to stay kind of close to its own borders. Um, it'd be very interesting to sort of hear more about that. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, the reason for that is that, you know, Russia never really ran out of, Russia never really ran out of places to conquer, um, which were proximate. And um, the other, you know, the other reason was that you know, so often the, the fleets of the, um, the, the Baltic, First of all, they, got, they only became a naval power very late. Peter the Great made them a naval power in the Baltic. But remember, the Baltic, in the Baltic, you have to, you have to pass Britain to get anywhere. And Britain was the, happened to be the greatest naval power that had ever existed. So it was very hard to get out of the Baltic. And the Black Sea Fleet, that was only in the 18th, late 18th century that they became a, um, a, 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 you know, a, a, southern, a, a southern naval power. And that was also, and the Mediterranean was also dominated by Britain, which is, brings us back to the reason why Britain and Britain and Russia loathed each other in the 19th century. But you know, they did actually, they did actually get, they had, they had Alaska, as you know, and they also went down the coast of California to, to very near to, um, to San Francisco, to Fort Ross. And you know, there are some fascinating. Um, Stalin asked. The end of in 1945, Stalin was trying to get um, was trying to get a naval base in Libya. Stalin asked for Libya, and the, the Western powers agreed to give him Libya, um, which he never which, which he never then got. Um, Catherine the Great and Potemkin were discussing having um, Mar uh, Marbella, Mallorca, as a naval base. So there were kind of aspirations. Um, Paul, Emperor Paul occupied the Ionian Islands and Malta at various, you know, and, and, and aspired to Malta at various times. So they almost did, um, but they never ran out of proximate land, land because when Europe was closed to them after the Crimean War, they switched to the Far East. And they really, and after 1877, they switched to the Far East. And then they hoped to get Manchuria and Korea. And as we know, that didn't end well for the Romanov dynasty because it led to the 1905 revolution. Good question. Uh, sure. The gentleman in the green shirt, please. I'll uh, 
I'll kind of take a, a continuation from the same question. Thank you for pointing out that the spheres of influence in Russia and Britain came within 20 miles of each other in Afghanistan. And then there is the whole... But hold, the, hold, the micro, hold the microphone near. So Peter Hopkirk in his book uh, describes uh, Russia's strategic fear as a fear of encirclement, uh, driven mainly by their limitation on the Arctic on the north and the, and the, and the marauding tribes or the, south, the, the Central Asian campaigns. Uh, in today's context, how do you see the situation in Crimea? Is this, do you see the, 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 the venture in, U, in Ukraine a manifestation of this strategic uh, insecurity? Yeah, that's a nice question. Yeah, so, so, I mean, one of the interesting things is, you know, Britain always gets, Britain, people who write about the British Empire and its relationship with India always sort of talk about how, um, always talk about how the, the, the sort of, the fear of Russian advance towards India was a, was a myth. And all the wars in Afghanistan and Central Asia and the sort of the great game narrated by the great Peter Hopkirk um, is a sort of, was in the minds of idiotic British um, empire builders. But actually, no one who studies Russia would think that. And actually, Russia, you know, the, the Russia was, was hungrily advancing south and east into Central Asia in the 1860s, as, as, you, as, you, as you mentioned. But of course, you know, the, the, the advance into Ukraine and Crimea is, 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 you know, follows very traditional Russian security um, concerns, which, you know, that you know, the Russian Empire doesn't, it can't exist without the security of Ukraine, either as a, as a satellite state, as a client state, or as an occupied part of Russia. And so th that is, that is, you're absolutely right, that is, that is what has led to the war today. Hi there, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Um, well, so fascinating interview, thank you so much. That's been really great to listen to. I, I'll try to be as articulate in phrasing this question as you've been in uh, addressing everything that's been raised so far. So um, we talked a little bit about Lemberg, we talked a little bit about how recently that part of the country came into the Russian sphere of influence. And obviously there's a particular history to that part of the world. I think the current narrative obviously is to cast Russia very much in the mold of aggressor. But one of the comments which I think I've read is that when he invaded the east of the country in particular, there was a, a reference to denazification. So I'd just be really interested to get your perspective as to whether here in the West we're a little bit misty-eyed perhaps in the way we're viewing the current conflict uh, and to get your perspective as to whether there is an aspect to this current war which is maybe more than just land grab? That's a very good question and that's a fascinating, that's a, you bring up a fascinating issue there. Um, you're absolutely right that um, it's now become, um, R Russia, I believe, I, I believe that there's no doubt that Russia is the aggressor here and there's no doubt that the denazification calumny is a libel against Ukraine today. I mean, the fact of the matter is that the, that yes, that, that, that there are, that there are, there have been tiny far right wing um, units and movements, um, factions, I've described them in, in Ukraine. They really are tiny. And, and one can't possibly mention them without saying that, you know, many of the, um, many of the sort of uh, client, Russian clients in the Donbass in East, in East, in East Ukraine, are also are also national socialists and Nazis, and openly so. So, you know, but but the point is that the the denazification is a smear, you know, by Russia. Um, but and 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 the denazification is a, is such a smear that actually in the parliament there are no far right people in the parliament now because the number of voters who support extreme right-wing parties is below the one or two percent, um, uh, you know, threshold to get even get into, so they're, they're not even in parliament now. So that is a complete um, libel. But, but this is the interesting thing about it, is that at the same time, we must be very careful in um, telling the whole story of Ukrainian history and not whitewashing it. Because that also plays, I believe that plays into Russian hands, it plays into Putin's hands. The fact is that in the Second World War, and this is, this is very important, and this is now barely covered anywhere in the press, in, on Twitter, because no one wants to, 
No one wants to mention it because it's an inconvenience about Russian history, uh, about Russian and Ukrainian history. But in the, in the Second World War, um, there was substantial Ukrainian collaboration with the Nazis um, uh, under Stepan Bandera. And, you, uh, and, and, and they did take part in, you know, in the massacres of the Holocaust of Jews and Poles for that matter. And so there is a story to be told. And, um, but the point is to be very clear what one's talking about. That was, that was in World War II. That happened. But the, the, present, um, the present claim of, de -Nazi of a Nazification of Ukraine is a complete piece of Putinist propaganda. Sure. The gentleman uh, behind, please. Thank you. Um, on a lighter note, I'm um, just fascinated by the comparison between Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great. I mean, both very violent men, um, strong constitution, you know, alcohol, women, both killed their son. Um, um, what, what are your thoughts about this violent streak in the Russian leadership, even in today's leadership? Is it more akin to what Ivan the Terrible had? I mean, at the end of the day, he's still the terrible and Peter is still great. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, the, uh, I mean, Peter actually built the Navy, expanded the Russian power. So both of them are monumental in, in the history of Central Asia and, and Russia. Um, but uh, no matter how much Putin wants to be Peter the Great, you know, when, when, when you look at the history, it's more Ivan the Terrible that I, uh, I'm reminded of. So it's just a light comparison, it's not... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, listen, you've mentioned that... I, I like this question because um, you know, he's mentioned two of, the, two of the great towering figures of, czar, of czarist hit Russian history. And every, as I said, you know, every, every Russian leader is in the footsteps of these two. And, you know, um, Ivan the Terrible really began the, the Russian Empire when he took Kazan and Astrakhan in the south. The Khan, they, were, they were Mongol Khanates, and he conquered them. I mean, the reason why he's still known as the Terrible is, is, is because, you know, he actually, I mean, I actually think he was, he was, he was mentally ill, and he actually went mad, and no one could get rid of him because he was the Tsar, and the Tsar was then regarded as such a sacred figure. But he actually destroyed his own work and very nearly destroyed the entire, um, the entire empire as it stood at, the mo at that time. And he also killed his own son, which is never a, never a good sign. But the reason why Peter the Great is great is because his achievements endured. And, um, you know, the empire he left, you know, grew, the dynasty survived, um, the navy survived, everything that he did actually endured longer. So, so but the two characters, the two characters are, are, are very fascinating. And of course, they were both Stalin's heroes. The gentleman in the white shirt, sorry, you've had your hand up. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so, uh, there's this newfound relationship between Russia and China now, um, having been quite distant from each other for decades, centuries. Um, do you think there's more substance to that? Um, both sort of taking an anti-Western alliance stance and actually collaborating on land, sea, and air probably for the first time in a very long time. Um, yeah, I do. I think, it's, I think the China-Russia the China -Russia alliance is, is very important. I mean, it's the, it's the reason why I believe that, you know, it, it, it's against the Western interest and the interest of democracies for, um, for Russia to win. And the reason why it's, it's very important that Russia doesn't win is because that would be a triumph of a certain worldview of spheres of influence of, uh, and of autocracy. Um, let's face it, you know, Russia and, uh, let, let, let's not sugarcoat this. I mean, Russia and China are both control states, you know, that, that um, with massive security, um, massive security establishments that control their people, that um, execute opponents, that just physically destroy um, their enemies within. And, um, you know, so who wants to live in that kind of country? You know, most, many young Russians don't want to. Many Ch young Chinese don't want to either, you know. And so the alliance is very important. I mean, one has to, you know, one has to note that, of course, Russia and China were very close just after 1949 when Mao took power with huge Russian backing. 
in 48, 47, 48, 49. Um, and Russia, Stalin was very much the master then. And, you know, he famously kept Mao waiting um, for weeks in Moscow in 1949 when, when Mao was, mm -hmm. was made to wait and was very humiliated by Stalin. But when Stalin died, Mao regarded himself as the real um, high priest of international Marxism. And of course, Mao was also a massive history buff who read, endlessly read history. In fact, he died listening to, Russia, to, to Chinese history being, re um, being read to him as an old man. So, um, of course, he was then bound to argue with Khrushchev and then came the, the, the Sino-Soviet um, schism. And so, once again, it's incredibly important, their alliance. The question is, what is China going to get out of it? And for the moment, it looks like China um, still has strong interests that lead it to stay allied with, China, with Russia against the West. The problem will be is, it, is if Western withdrawal from China leads to an economic crisis in China. If there's an economic cost, they'll begin to question whether this Russian alliance works for them. But until then, it's a very, very it's, it, it's, the, it's the key axis of the world. So I think, unfortunately, we have no more time left. Um, very sorry if there's anyone still left to ask any questions, but uh, I think we will be at uh, outside to sign some books, and you're welcome to, uh, to, to kind of uh, pop by, have any books signed, and ask, uh, drop a, ask a question if you'd, if you'd really like. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Ah!